Hi, this is Rick Moreno from Natopia Cider, San Diego, and you are listening to Cider Chat. Episode 116. Hello and welcome to Cider Chat. My name is Rhea Windcaller, and I am the producer and cider MC of this weekly podcast, where we speak with makers, enthusiasts, and folks within the cider trade from around the world. And this week, we are in San Diego speaking to Rick Marino of Newtopia Cider. There'll be more on that chat in just a moment. Welcome back to all the regular subscribers of Cider Chat. We got a great episode this week. And if you are new to this podcast, well, hey, thanks for coming into our party, which never seems to stop. There are over 116 episodes right now. And I was recently contacted by Jordan on Facebook, on the Cider Chat Facebook page. And he put out, you know, asking, which was the episode on forced carbonation? And I drew a total blank. Uh, I needed my notes. And I finally did find out it was episode 70, what is it, 71, with Yep Against of Fejo Cider in Denmark. And before Yep and I began talking, I spoke about forced carbonating CO2, which is that typical gas that people put into actually many different libations, but in this case cider, and how to do that, at least how I do that. Uh, there's a number of different options, but for like somebody like myself who's not commercial, this is how I do it. And I, I was able to search that, thankfully for the internet and for computers. But there's a lot on our plate right now if you are new to this gig and our conversations out here in Ciderville. And frankly, I was going to take this week off and just read you all a little love poem that I was working on with the Tonkin Palms, but... They convinced me not to do that because there are so many fantastic conversations that I have in the queue, not necessarily ready to go because I have a lot of editing, but in the queue that have to get out there, I mean, weeks ahead here. So I, I'm doing that. And it was really easy for me to edit once I got rolling the episode that we're going to be doing this week with Rick from Newtopia Cider. Uh, that was fantastic. I'm going to hold back on that for now. In the meanwhile, I want to come back in just a moment and share with you my thoughts on what you might be wanting to think about for the coming months if you are in the northern hemisphere of the world. So I'll be right back with that shortly. I have the first reminder of this episode, which is make sure you are racking over your cider. Do not put that off, especially if you're a non-commercial maker who is new to this game and listening, or even if you're a startup or you've been doing it for a long time, I'm sure you, you, you know this already, you have it on your books, but those of us who are doing it more as a hobby, make sure that you get that cider off the lees that's dropping on the bottom of your carboy, which is a glass vessel, right? Some people might be putting it in different things. Unless you keep on stirring in the lees, which is good. I'm not going to go into all that right now. But the main thing is you want to be checking that. Most likely you pressed in the fall or you got your juice in the fall and it fermented. That's the primary fermentation. It went through and then there was precipitants dropping off onto the bottom of your carboy. And that is the lees or what I like to call the schmutz. If you leave it there and don't rack it off again, then what happens is it has a potential for, a really good potential for leaving off odors and off flavors that you probably don't want because those are essentially dead yeast cells and other little organisms hanging out there. So do rack. In fact, that's what I did all weekend while it was raining. I got down to the carboys, which I hadn't looked at since I had my surgery in November on my shoulder. Uh, And... I couldn't, I couldn't do anything, but they were just sitting there just humming away the, the cider, and it was perfect timing to rack it all over. In fact, that's how I really manage my cider in terms of clarifying it. I do a lot of racking. Uh, it's not that big of a deal to do for me. I, I'm not sure 
about everybody's setup, but for me to have a clean carboy and keep on letting that drop down, the precipitants drop down, rack it off of the lees. I do that a number of times. Shoot, you know, if I'm not going to be bottling until May, there's a good chance that I'm going to be racking off maybe about five times between the initial primary fermentation and that uh, bottling. In fact, if I move the carboy right before the night before that I'm going to be bottling, I'll rack it off in the morning too if I get any kind of schmutz in the bottom. And that's mainly for presentation, uh, just to have it clarified. I don't have anything wrong with cloudy cider, except that if it's sitting in the bottle, it will eventually drop down. Uh, I did rack off some, what was it? Um, I was using the uh, yeast KV1116. Yeah, 116. And I really liked its profile. So I decided, you know, I only had three gallons, so I'm going to bottle it. And I used the rest to top off all the carboys that I had sitting there on my table. There was a bit of airspace. So I used that juice from the three gallon, topped off all my existing carboys, and then the rest I bottled. And I put in just a little bit of priming sugar, which I never ever do. So I sure hope I don't have any bottle bombs. And what I mean by that is that the bottles can actually, you know, burst and be dangerous. So I picked some flip top bottles, some hefty ones. I have it in a wooden box that I layered with a plastic bag, put, I think I've had about eight bottles in there. They're about 750 mil bottles. So they're pretty, pretty big. And then I partitioned each one with some paper bags that I just folded up. And so I figure if there is any kind of burst, I mean, really like a bango burst, it won't hit the other bottle because then it could be just like a chain reaction, right? And I have it in a very cool area uh, in my home that won't be warming up until, shoot, probably mm, early June or so. So by then I'll be able to check and, and keep on looking at it. And I did this Originally, I was thinking about kegging it because I thought that would be be fun, but I did this because I wanted to kind of just watch that process. I'm getting used to this yeast. All my ciders this year, I decided I'm not adding any sugar to it unless I'm priming it. And priming, again, is just to um, kickstart any remaining yeast cells that are in the cider to create some carbonation, a little bit of fizz in there. Uh, I like that. That's fun. Uh, I don't always do that. I love still cider, but I'm playing with that. And I'm definitely just doing straight cider. I'm not adding anything because uh, I want to get to know the orchards that I was scrumping apples at, essentially, pulling these apples out and, and getting their their terroir. That is tons of fun for me. That's what I'm into now. I'm not so much doing a lot of add-on of uh, fruit ciders or anything like that. So I'll keep you posted on that. Make sure that you do rack over your cider. Do not put that off. Um, and make sure that once you do rack it over, that you fill that that gap of, of liquid and airspace that could be in your carboys with more cider. Don't fill it with water. That's not a good idea. Uh, you could add more apple juice, you know, sweet cider if you want, but you, I would recommend heating it up ahead of time. And then you could also just add some commercial cider, get some, you know, uh, mass kind of produced commercial cider that's kind of inert in a way and just pour that in. Um, I don't know, I think inert's the right word for that. You know, it's just not going to really change the yeast too much and uh, top it off. The main thing is top it off. I always try to save cider from the previous year for topping off. So th these are the little tricks of the ch trade that you don't realize you're in the middle of and you're like, oh crap, what am I going to do now? I have all this headspace. So um, yeah, that that's the way to go. If anybody has any other thoughts on that, you could post that on the Cider Chat Facebook page and we could have a little chit chat there. Or of course, you could always send me an email, ria at ciderchat.com. Dot com. The second key thing you want to be thinking about right now is planting your fruit trees this spring or getting rootstock or scion wood for grafting. And I'm putting in on an order with friends, getting some pear rootstock that I'm going to graft some peri-pear uh, scion wood on. 
So that's great. The resources that we're using is Cummings Nursery. Uh, I'm getting outstanding semi-vigorous clonal stock. (laughs) That's a word. Excellent anchorage. That means the roots are good. Tolerant of soil diseases. Very resistant to fire blight. Tolerant of low temperature. Induces early heavy production. So uh, that's what I'm getting. Some pear root stock for peri pears. I also want to recommend Fedco Trees. Their catalog is out. It's just delightful to look at. Uh, You still could get the orders in by March 9th. If you haven't listened to the episode with John Bunker, he had two episodes. Episode both 16, where we talk generally about apple trees in the U.S., and episode 28, where he provides great insight on tree identification. They're both definitely worth a uh, a listen to. John Bunker is just like an American apple hero. And then also to kind of get you in the groove, you can listen to Colin Scott of E&J Scotch Orchards. He is selling saplings of apple varieties such as Northern Spy and Redfield, plus others. He's located in western Massachusetts in my spot of Ciderville, and he is in the town of Buckland. So if you listen to his episode number 93, we talk about apple storage, but we also talk about grafting. And uh, there at that episode 93, you can find his contact info in the show notes. So do think about these two things, uh, racking over and getting your orders in, because before you know it, spring is going to be here. This past January, I was in San Diego, and I took the opportunity to meet up with Rick Moreno of Newtopia Cider. This is a $1.5 million build-out of a cidery that is, man, between now and next year, there's going to be a lot going on here. And Rick is a dude to just keep your eye on because I don't know where he gets his energy, but somehow he does it. And from all I could see, he does it with a really sweet smile on his face. We had a lot of fun, the Nose and I, meeting Rick, sipping the ciders. Uh, It is a fusion kind of cidery in that, not that they're fusing the the two styles together. Well, yeah, they kind of are. But essentially, there is the modern side of the cidery, and on the other side, well, that and that has all these stainless steel tanks, and on the other side, it's barrels. Uh, A really interesting business model. Just dig the whole scene there. Uh, I... I really enjoyed the ciders. Each one was super duper unique. Didn't have a chance to drink his or taste his heritage ciders uh, because they are, as you might expect, for a cidery that's almost one year old in April, they're not out yet because that's what happens with heritage ciders, folks. They need some time to settle. And I know many of you know that. Modern ciders, you could kind of kick out in like six weeks, but those traditional Real ciders, in terms of there's nothing added, they take more time. So he's working those two different worlds and building from there. So without further ado, let's head to San Diego and grab a glass with Rick Moreno of Newtopia Cider. Oh my goodness, and there's a flight of ciders coming over right now, looking really, really pretty. Take you from left to right. Our flagship cider that we just recently took a medal for four months ago was our Mm semi-sweet. And so I'll go out and forage uh, eucalyptus leaves from Hoyt Park East, which is just a park about two miles uh, east of here. And I'll bring them, I'll bring the eucalyptus leaves back here in bushels. Wow. And then I'll send them to San Francisco to get uh, food grade. And then I send them back and then I'll blend those eucalyptus leaves with hibiscus flowers. And it's Mm -hmm. got this minted sprig, off dry, just yes, really I herbaceous. Do, yeah, they're getting that really minty. Yeah. I mean, I, one of the things I love coming back to California for is just like that whiff of eucalyptus. Yes. Yes. And, you know, you go out at night mm-hmm. and you're just like mm-hmm. feeling after the day all the 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 herbs out there. It's just Precisely. insane. And it does something to your body. It does. You know, it's so beautiful. It does. It's uh, it's quite nice. It's very serene. Uh, it's uh, It gives a little bit of, the eucalyptus gives a little bit of a nice bite. Uh, towards it, blended with that hibiscus flower. Wow. Um, and uh, herbaceous is key, uh, especially out 
in San Diego, uh, where kombucha is also very popular. Yeah, and yeah, So yeah. it, it kind of sits on that uh, similar type of, of um, profile. Yeah, you're uh, carbonating your ciders, Precisely, of course, yep. But I'm not seeing a lot of bubbles. So wh what are you doing there? So, so we're just uh, infusing our cider with anywhere between 2.2 .2 to 2.3 grams per okay. milliliter. Um, okay. I like the mouth feel of, of of the cider just a little bit, but I also like the flavor um, of having it kind of semi still. Yes, yeah. And, you know, it's interesting because when I first sipped it, mm -hmm. it came off with that fizz, mm -hmm. and then it really diminished. Mm -hmm. You know, so it puckered mm -hmm. up. It did mm -hmm. pucker up. I didn't get a pucker, but it mm -hmm. really kind of like woke up my mouth mm -hmm. in a way in that same way that that eucalyptus does Precisely. when i'm arriving into california yeah. and then it you know it kind of yeah. like led me in really yep. nice man really nice yeah no yeah the eucalyptus is very prominent as you can tell in our city um i just wanted to highlight that because it uh you know sometimes gets a, a bad name out here uh, yeah. because of the low roots that it has and it, all the trees fall so i wanted to I wanted to give a I wanted to give an extra special um, story behind it and and um, and think of it in an optimistic way. Mm -hmm. So well, you are you're totally getting it optimistic and mm -hmm. because everybody gets so happy around the eucalyptus <laughs> yes, trees. You know, it's like you're in California, yes. sunny, and all that. Yeah, I'm engaging a lot with the uh, you know the uneducated beer connoisseur, the uneducated cider connoisseur, and the uneducated wine connoisseur. And so created a four core that hits every part of your palate. So this is kind of off dry, herbaceous, semi-sweet. This is our Belgian Saison um, cider. It's quite nice. I use a Belgian Saison beer blend and I blend it with uh, pineapple, elderberry is the color, and cardamom is the spice. Wow. And um, it's quite lovely. Um, it lends towards the fruity, phenolic, uh, funky type of cider. It um, it's our number one seller, to be quite frank. Interesting. Okay, so Rick just said elderberry is a color. So we're mm -hmm. looking at a very deep, rich elderberry. Mm -hmm. And if people aren't aware of what elderberry looks like, mm -hmm. if you plucked it off the elderberry tree, it would get all over your hand and mm -hmm. leave it really mm -hmm. kind of purpley, like inky, purpley. Inky, yeah, yeah. Yep. And probably be hard to get off. It is. Oh yeah. But who cares? Because you just were in the elderberry <laughs> bush, right? It is. You know, I love the elderberry because uh, you know it increases the acuity of your eyes. So uh, mm -hmm. it's it's beneficial for you from oh that perspective. Oh my gosh! I yeah. really enjoy that. I Ooh. know it's like a berry delight, but it's not just berry. You know? Yeah, the the pineapple's kind of an afterthought. Uh, mm. I just wanted it to be in the back end to clear that oh palate. Oh my god! The pineapple just totally comes up That's as lovely. you thought of it as an afterthought, mm -hmm. but. Mm -hmm. It's kicking up on mm -hmm. the taste buds. Wow, yeah, that's we, nice blending. We serve the, uh, all of our ciders at 40 degrees. Uh, what we found out is once we cup that particular cider and we get to about 45 to 50 degrees, the cardamom gets very spicy. All, the, all of the flavors really come to nose. Yeah. Um, uh, and um, I enjoy it. You know, it's, it's, uh, it's not for the faint of heart. It's 8.2%. Wow, so. it's one of those like... Um, Mm -hmm. Slow creepers. It isn't is. It? Little, yes, it's like a tropical creeper. It um, it's it's very easy to consume. Yeah. So we it have has to... that sweet sweetness that people mm -hmm. kind of expect with cider. Yeah. And uh... so this next cider I really enjoy. Um, actually, this is our wild cider. So I'll take eighteen hundred pounds a month of the Marionberry, which I'm sure you're familiar with. It's the Cabernet of Blackberries mm -hmm. up in Oregon. Mm -hmm. And I work with uh, a particular farmer up there where I'll go up and I'll take these, uh, harvest with them, and ship it down. I'll make our wild cider, which is kind of a, uh, it's very, I use champagne yeast, so it's very uh, off dry, funky, um, huh. it's kind of tarty. Sweetness is kind of an afterthought in this. It almost drinks like a French Pinot. I really enjoy this. Be believe it or not, I take this and I'll put three ounces of gin in it, and I'll blend my wild with gin, and it's so nice. Okay. But now, what, what's the color that? You, how would you describe that color? Yeah, it's almost like when it f when it first comes off batch, it's like this just really unique, like ruby, translucent. Um, you know, at times it even comes off as an amethyst. Right when it comes off, as huh. it rests, though, it's almost like a, you know, it's almost like a, like a. 
Yeah, like a pinky peach. Peach, I was going to yeah. say peach, yeah. Like yeah. a pinchy peach yeah, type of... Peach yeah, peach going on there. And, uh, a little reddish peach. Almost yes. like a red uh, grapefruit kind of color, too. Like a ruby red grapefruit. Yeah. yeah. And you know what's interesting? I know that you're in the San Diego scene where mm-hmm. craft beer is such a hot, hot scene. Huge hot. And rightly so. Mm-hmm. And, you know, you serve these ciders on this little flight here. And there's like this little, <laughs> like, head going on there. A little rim that kind of, yep. if you're like that craft beer, you know, Precisely. switch over. Or mm-hmm. Somebody's used to that. Mm-hmm. That's familiar, and, and uh, mm-hmm. it helps. It helps the market. It does. You know, it's it's nice to be able to have that, um, you know, it's uh, that tulip nose. Again, you know, um, cider is 90% nose, 10% palate for us, and um, that's quite lovely. It's, wow. it's, isn't it? I don't think there's no gin. I'm, I am a gin person. Are you? Yes. Nice. Big, well, oh. I, I, I'm oh. an everything person. <laughs> <laughs> Like, no, but, I agree. But I don't think this needs any gin at all. I mean, that is... Now, what's the ABV on this? That one's 6.5. 6.5. And, uh, I like and what, to... what's the four core? Uh, in terms of ABB or just... Yeah, ABB. The, uh, so this is... So our semi-sweet is 5.8. Our Belgian pineapple is 8.2. Our wild is 6.5. And our IPC uh, is 6.5 as well. 6.5. So we got yeah. four different ciders here mm-hmm. and a range of ABVs. Yeah. I, I think ABV carries for us big body. And so I didn't want to, you know, I don't want to um, dilute recipe. I wanted to make sure it came off how it was supposed to be. Um, you know, hence the, a little bit bigger of the body. Um, wow, I just really, I, I enjoy really that. Beautiful, wow! You could taste that organ, right? Right there. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. No, it, it's, it's beautiful too. It's a really. I mean, we have it. We're sipping these ciders mm-hmm. right now in that classic kind of cider glass mm-hmm. sampler, which is a mm-hmm. um, mm-hmm. little fluted and yep. a little ribbed on the bottom, yep. a wide mouth on the top. Mm-hmm. But this would be mm-hmm. beautiful in a fluted wine glass or something like that. Absolutely. Man. Right? Absolutely. That would... Yeah. I might have to take you up on that, actually. So yeah, that I mean, that, that's very classy, classy. Yeah, it's... Uh, presentation's important. You know, I mean, it's cider's very sophisticated, mm-hmm. magical, and fun. Ooh. So wow. we want to... Uh, you know, it's it's again, it's introducing these these um, palate teasers to the uneducated connoisseur. You know, that mm-hmm. may want to get into cider or has previously had a macro cider that doesn't understand that cider can be different. You know, dry, off dry, yeah. sweet, bone dry. You know, so it's um, this next one is our Indian Pale cider. This is kind of a nod to San Diego. Um, you know, mm-hmm. we love our hops out here, and um, the reason why hops do so well out in San Diego is because our water is so hard, and so the hops tend to do better in hard water, um, more minerals to expand that flavor. Um, so what I decided to do is uh, choose the mosaic hop, um, mm-hmm. and we kept this relatively dry. I think it finished at like 10, 10, original gravity. Mm-hmm. Okay. We always ferment down to zero, and then uh, we use you know certain adjuncts to um, to blend in that are fermentable, right? Um, and then some adjuncts that, like for example, like put, putting cider in wood creates a unique characteristic and sometimes gives it a bump in ABV considering what type of barrel you put it in, right? right? If it's a rye whiskey or yeah. if it's a wine barrel or whatever. Mm-hmm. Yep. Mm-hmm. Yep, yep. So, you know, we, we dry hopped this mosaic IPC, uh, and we also used our champagne yeast uh, to make sure that it, it, it continued to create that aromatic, effervescent nose, mm-hmm, at least. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, the hop is nice because it, you know, when you dry hop the hop on cider, you probably get, you probably get aromatics, mm-hmm. but we, we changed our plot process and actually we rouse for about 24 hours and uh, it really extracts a lot of the oils. So are you saying dry hop there when you roused? Is that we, what you're... we do. Okay. Well, dry hop, uh, yeah. you know, yeah. um, you know, and temperatures mm-hmm. anywhere between 50 to 65 degrees, depending on the hop, and depending on if it's wet hopped. This particular one is dry hopped. Mm-hmm. Um, I also have a wet hopped here, I think, okay. that wow. we just did, wow. which is very rare. It's only done once a year. Um, but yeah, this is this is for our beer connoisseurs, and it's yeah. uh, it's drier. It's probably the the most bitter and drier of our ciders. Bitter is a palate characteristic mm-hmm. that is prominent in San Diego. Everyone's we have a bunch of hop heads out here, you know. So 
Um, oh yeah, uh, that's a hop uh, cider. Oh yes, it is. Yeah. Mm. So, and the hop heads are going to dig that. They do. They come in here and immediately they'll be biting into that. You know, immediately, classic thing. Classic with a, thing. A craft beer. Yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, so, mm. you know, it's uh, it's an uh, the Indian pale cider. It's nice because it's a single hop bottle and it's blended. I mean, that's crazy now. Okay, well, let's just back up the door here because mm-hmm. we, we hear that like the India Pale Cider, mm-hmm. which is really only something that we're hearing. Thank you so much. Mm-hmm. Um, coming out of uh, San Diego. That's right. Yep. You know, yep. I mean, we're, we, I've been seeing hop ciders for a, mm-hmm. a, a couple of years now mm-hmm. for sure. Oh, yeah. But it was really coming to San Diego that I've been hearing folks wanting to call their ciders IPA ciders. Yeah. Which is kind of like a bastardization of the whole IPA thing. <laughs> and But that's true it for is. Americans because when Americans first started using the term imperial IPA, the you know, Russian imperial stout, the Europeans were pretty ticked off oh, about yes. that. They're like, there's nothing you could call imperial <laughs> yeah. except Russian imperial stout. Right. And now we have, you know, imperial IPA. We have right. imperial pilsners. Mm-hmm. The whole sky's the limit. Organic. So mm-hmm. why not mm-hmm. call this a an IPC? IP, IPC. IPC. Yeah, an Indian <laughs> pale cider. Um, you know, I've even some, I've even heard some IPAs called Indian huh. pale apple. In the so, pale apple. Yeah, okay. so I've I've, yep. I've seen that, mm-hmm. um, but you know that is that is you know very popular here just because is that is that though because our San Diego San Diego San Diegans <laughs> are they really choosing that kind of terminology because of the introduction into a craft beer scene of the cider is that really the the reason why choosing that kind of moniker for that particular cider do you think pushing that it is like so my own personal philosophy and this is just for just for me is you know is that if we didn't have craft beer drinkers in san diego craft cider would be very difficult to open to a mass market fortunately san diegans have very complex palates yes. because of beer right and because of 15 ingredients in beer to make it so they're able to relate to something because great I've heard it it has a hop in it yeah. and if they think water and hops go well wait till you try an apple and a hop mm-hmm. you know there's mm-hmm. different characteristics and I think they're able to relate to that and so that's a very easy crossover for them to uh, open their minds up because typically um, you know I get a lot of closed minded oh no cider's for sorority girls and, mm-hmm. and sweet otter pops right. and it's important to provide a little bit of insight um, you know, to the beer, big beer, big drinkers. You know, we have we have gentlemen in three piece suits, and we have you know, that love their wine connoisseurs, mm-hmm. and then we have gentlemen in their big beer bellies and big beards that are mm-hmm. sitting right there mm-hmm. having this for the first time, right. and talking politics and talking, you know, talking cider. And it's important for us to be able to, you know, provide some type of relation to to what's huge here, which is beer. Right, your full market. You're not just going to one little mm-hmm. niche market, mm-hmm. and you are, you know, able to hit the road running a little bit in a yep. unique market in that way. Precisely. Versus in other areas of the U.S. and mm-hmm. never mind. Yep. The rest of uh, Cyderville. Yep. Um, yeah. Yeah. Now we use yeah we use old world wine processes and we blend them with new world beer ingredients. And so the, how I got into it is you know my wife's a wine I'm a beer guy. This is the only libation that I could make for us to not flat over. So that's how this came to. It is compromise. (laughs) So, um, so, uh, so yeah. So you know, the four core is nice to give a nice introductory of what cider could be versus what they've had in the past. So the four core is the classic flight of ciders that you serve. It's it's just. If they want to get a flight of ciders, this is what they would be served. They do. We are, nice. we're, we're pretty stern. If no one has been into our facility and they've not experienced cider, uh, the four core is something that they have to try before you're able to even evolve into anything else. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, it's essentially guiding them, mm-hmm. you know, to what they may want. You know, because mm-hmm. sometimes they just you know, they just have no idea. They've never experienced something yeah, like this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I start them off with this, and um, and then based on what you know, where they where they enjoy the most. If it's sweeter, off dry, tart, bitter, herbal, I'll then be able to go into something else that they might 
you know, enjoy or never even thought about even trying. Yeah, yeah. So. Well, you yeah. really hit the whole gamut there. I mean. Yeah, and these are just, you know, again, these are our modern seasonals, um, you know, that come out of, um, you know, we did, you know, custom-made conical stainless mm-hmm. steel. Um, and so introducing modern seasonals to uh, craft beer drinkers and craft wine drinkers in San Diego is, is a nice introduction. We have our old world heritage ciders that are coming off uh, Petite Syrah, wet whiskey, wet rum, wet gin, wet bourbon, uh, Chardonnay barrels, uh, and brandy barrels as well. And so, um, you know, that is very funky, farmhouse esque. Uh, mm-hmm. We're incorporating a lot of uh, Brett Lacto mm-hmm. mm. into our barrel aged ciders, mm-hmm. which. You know, a lot of wine enthusiasts, they think I'm different of that kind of stuff. Well, they're so, not used to that at all. No. They're like, no, keep that out of the yes. vineyard. Yeah, no doubt. And we welcome it. Um, yeah. You know, there's certain yeah, there's certain bugs in those barrels that you know, help that create some uniqueness to it. So we want to make sure that um, the rest of San Diego has the option to experience that. So two different worlds happening at Utopia. Mm-hmm. And so, Let's talk about Let's talk about the name Utopia. Yes. Yeah. I mean, I want, I, want, yes. I don't want to miss that out because mm-hmm. you are straddling two worlds. Precisely. The new and the old. Yeah. So Not new in the old, but yeah. the new yep. um, in terms of modern style mm-hmm. of fermenting yep. and the more traditional style. Precisely. So, Utopia, let's, let's chat about that. So, you know, it's kind of a, ph- a philosophy. Uh, Natopia is more of a state of mind versus a product that you drink or a place where you go hang out. Mm-hmm. So, Natopia is derived from a couple different philosophies. One is Sir Isaac Newton, right, who discovered gravity when the apple fell on his head, hence new in the Newtopia. Utopia being the ideal society, which is essentially unachievable. It's something that, you know, is, is, is um, you know, every, where everyone, everything's self-sustainable, you know, every, you know, it's eco-friendly, things are, you know, things are the ideal. I wanted to make a new version of of what that society was when it came to cider consumption. Sorry about the helicopters. We're right by Top Gun Miramar here. Yeah, so, we are. We're, yeah. we're, you know, San Diego's right on the border, yeah. and you could hear yeah. there's a lot of military around oh, yeah. here. A lot of folks working in the military and a lot of services yep. for Homeland Security. Yeah, and so the Marines come over here all the time yep. uh, with their wives, of course, and... You know, they're using that as an excuse. They to come are. Over here. <laughs> they are. I hate, to, I hate to say it, but you know, women get it. You know, I have a tasting panel every Friday, uh, every Friday at three o'clock, and it's uh, fifteen people out of the fifteen, thirteen are women. Uh, and the reason why I do that is because when I ask a man what's our cider taste like, they give me one answer. When I ask a woman that, they give me fifteen adjectives. Uh-huh. And so, and not only that, but uh, uh-huh. letting a lady's palate's a little bit more acute. Than a man's not to discount us out there, guys, but no, um, just I think a little bit more sensitive to that. Uh, and so, when the Marines come over, they they boast how their wife's been ranting and raving, and they've never had cider, and they've traveled all around the world, and they've never had an American cider. And what? so, yeah, well, they've been traveling around the world. What are you doing? Get out of here! Yeah. There's cider all around. There the world. is. Whatever. So okay. you know, like <laughs> you know, it's one of those where they're just you know, it's a yeah. uh, it's a uh, you know, it's a stigma. They think yeah, it's... Yeah. They think Except it's, they don't know that Cider founded this country. Precisely. And it's like as, like, you know, yes. American as you could get. Yep. Yep. It's a fight. Yeah. I have to continuously yeah. re-educate. It's, uh... Oh, well. It's okay, though. Yeah, it's, it's okay. We're at, getting at there. At this stage, I mean, that that's exactly what has to happen. It is. So it's a balance. Yeah, it's a balance. And then, uh... I don't know what we have here. Oh, is this... Is this uh, from the Heritage? Is this our Mellow Malice? Which one is this? Oh, okay. <laughs> Got it. So this is uh, this is a modern season. This is banana apple bum. So we use uh, 220 pounds. And actually, this is what this is. Uh, this is because of one of. I was influenced by you on this one. Oh, good. Wait, say that up yes. a little bit. You're influenced yes. by Cider No, Cider yes. Chat. I was inspired by Cider Chat to create this uh, banana apple bum, which is made with. Uh, banana and brown sugar mm. uh, in the secondary, which kicks up the ABV <laughs> to about 10%. Oh my 
And so <laughs> throwing on the banana. Yeah. Are those working for Amazing. you? Amazing. I mean, cl- you know, clarity. I mean, this yes. is a really clear side. It just is. To mention that it's yep. like a yep. like a very light yep. straw. Yep. Very bright cider. Yep. Yep. The, the uh, banana, the brown sugar. Yep. Coming yep. through. Mm. It. Uh, I love that smell of banana. I have to say that your banana is a lot more defined than my banana ever was. <laughs> How many bananas are you putting in for? for so for, uh, for example, a 160 gallon batch, we'll put in anywhere between 220 to 260 pounds of bananas. And there's a, there's some good secrets there. You know, we don't, yeah. it's all about, it's, all, it's how do you make banana bread? Mm-hmm. How do you extract a little the, bit of this and that? Yeah. yeah. How do you extract? You know, how does that banana get to full maximum capacity so you can achieve terminal, terminal bricks? <laughs> right? Is that what they call it? Terminal yeah. bricks. Yeah. You don't. You know, a brown banana is just fermenting. Yep. Precisely. It's not on the rotten stage. Right. Yet. I I, mm-hmm. I welcome that. So mm-hmm. so we decided to do this. Believe it or not, this was a, a huge influence of cider chat. Awesome. And uh, yeah, that's cool. It's uh, it's very very popular we have to sell these in 10 ounce pours wow what's the abv on this one 10 percent 10 percent 10 percent well you got that additional it's a sweet so you know some of the 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 banana comes through on the nose Mm -hmm. and that brown sugar is you know people taste like brown sugar thinking like whole house cookies or something like that but it's not like that at all it's like tangy a little bit it's a little tangy totally Mm -hmm. with that because you have Mm -hmm. the apple as the base Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, man, ten percent—that's a dangerous cider. It it is. It is. That's why we only sold serve, serve those in ten ounce pours. Uh, we have sixteen ounce goblets, uh, ten ounce, uh, you know, just uh, uh, glasses for high gravity cider. Mm-hmm. Which, uh, again, I don't want to, you know, I don't want to discount the recipe if it comes out like that. You know, I want it to keep it like that. Yeah, yeah. So. Very interesting finish, too. Mm-hmm. It's, um, mm-hmm. I'm a big banana fan. Mm-hmm. I think it goes super well with the cider. This is an excellent commercial example of that. Mm-hmm. But your unique style. And the finish of the banana is right there. Oh, yeah. As if I just kind of had that perfect <laughs> banana. Yeah. And um, yep. that residual sweetness is mm-hmm. really nice, nice lingering there. Yeah, it's lovely. Yeah. And if you wouldn't have talked about it, I wouldn't have made it. Oh, so, right on. thank you. Yay. Yeah, Yay you guys. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Thank you. Yeah. So, um, you know, we we tend to create ciders that um, you know people will hopefully one day be able to take home. Uh, we're canning these, so those will be going in 16 ounce tall boys here at the end of January. Now, what, what are you canning here? Because uh, I saw you have a list on the uh, website. We do so the IPA yep. or the IPC. IPC. Yep. IPC, the wild, the Belgian pineapple, and our semi-sweet. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, and um, coming out in like four packs. Yep, four okay. pack, uh, four pack, uh, sixteen ounce uh, tall boys. Believe it or not. Mm, nice. Canyon cans are huge here. Uh, we yeah. can take them surfing, skiing, and hiking all in the same day in San Diego. Mm-hmm. So. Um, are you using mobile canning? We are, for now. Yep. Um, I'm looking at a couple ca- uh, canning lines. Um, I'm just perfecting our process right now um, so that we can go in um, very, very big distribution here at the end of the year. Mm. Uh, we did, year to date, we did roughly you know 2,250 barrels of cider year to date. We have three more months until we're a year old, so I'm tracking to do about roughly 3,300 barrels of cider by April 1st. Well, that's a pretty righteous amount. Yeah. It, uh, you know, a year into like a, a new cider, everything that's going on, and you're straddling both types mm-hmm. of fermentation. Mm-hmm. So you don't really want... I know you have it on one side of the building mm-hmm. on the other, but mm-hmm. there could be some cross... There is, yes. You know? So we have to use a separate bottling line, yeah. separate canning line. Everything's got to be in barrel. Nothing touches stainless steel. Um, all of our old world will be in 500 ml bottles that are in spirits and then 750s for our wine program so everything will be contained that's very important to Mm -hmm. us Mm -hmm. of course Um, but uh, so currently when folks come here they they can get cans they can yeah fresh right off tap we have 32 ounce crowlers that we pour immediately right off tap 
Uh, we do have a members club, and so the only core that the public can take is our four core in cans. If you're a member, you have access to everything. Yeah. So wow. um, that's very popular for us. Uh, it gives us the ability to do um, just really micro batches, one-time limited releases. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. Uh, believe it or not, on the weekends we have lines around this place. Oh, it is. It's very cool. It's I exciting. Love that. I it love is. That. It is. And that must feel good. So I, w- I want to talk about that. Yeah. Why Newtopia cider? Why did you dive into cider? That's a great question. So I own a craft beer bar, whiskey, and mezcal bar called Toronado. Uh, Tornado, there's one in uh, San Diego, there's one in San Francisco. Uh, uh, I own the one up in uh, Seattle, hence my acclamation around the apple. Um, I've been selling cider across my bar for a number of years, and I thought to myself, you know, this is such an underserved uh, market, and I think there's so much more to be had here, um, particularly in other areas of the country. Yeah. And I knew San Diego was struggling for something like that. Um, and um, I just started to play around with it and, and tour a few facilities up there. Mm-hmm. I have my favorites up there that uh, I get inspired by. And uh, um, and I just wanted to take those flavors down to Southern California to open up people's minds. Yep, yep, yep. So well, that was... Uh, that's a good enough reason right there. Yes. Yeah. So you weren't really yes. making beer, you were selling beer, you were in the, the trade. Uh, yeah, I've been... Uh, I've all been, trade, essentially. But. Yeah, I've been, I've been home vintning for 10 years, I've been making beer for five. Okay. Most recently, beer my pe- has been the most pre- previous, most recent five years has been beer. 10 years has been home vintning. Mm-hmm. So I've been playing with mm-hmm. it. I've been really honing in on the cider recipes for about two years. It took me about two years to really mm-hmm. get in the ratios and um, being able to um, understand my fermentation. Um, one thing I did not disclose that I'll share with you guys is that people, process, and technology are the biggest pillars in our business. So I leverage technology a lot here. I have a PLC that automates all of my fermentation that I can keep on phone. my cell phone yeah. anywhere in the world that I go. For example, I'll fly in nomadic vintners and distillers to come train me for two weeks at a time. I just had a gentleman from Austria, one from Barcelona, one from Walla Walla um, come in and they'll stay here. I have a gypsy brewery street around, around the corner. And I'll show you guys that. But they eat here, they sleep here, they shower here, they don't leave. I don't get them a hotel, I don't get them a car. <laughs> so that way they don't have one throat to choke. <laughs> right? And so they... Brilliant. And so I come here straight for two weeks and I'm embedded. We work for 16 hours a day. We talk about recipe development. And then I also give them access remotely so that way they can, they can, they can view my ferments from anywhere in the country and send me a text message or an email on what I could be doing or how I could curb this. And so I constantly get that education from from those that are outside of the U.S. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So I could, we can make it our own new American cider, right? That's right. the goal. Right. This is our cider. Yep. We gotta we gotta harness that. Mm-hmm. You know. Um, mm-hmm. So I so I I love having that automation. It gives me consistency in cider, which is uh, sometimes difficult. Um, it's not like beer. Beers, they're always pushing for consistency. Mm-hmm. I get it, mm-hmm. but you know we're a craft cider. Mm-hmm facility that has different vintage, vintages, different picks, different orchards that we pull from. The terroir is different in every single one of our private estate orchards. We, we, we source locally here in Julian, Temecula, Santa Cruz, Sebastopol, Northern California, Mendocino, uh, Hood River, Chelan, uh, Wenatchee, essentially Eastern Washington. And so it's a logistical nightmare. Yeah, I was crush on say, site. Holy smokes! Wow. We have. So uh, are you? Uh, it's being crushed and juiced and then shipped. Depending on what estate. Okay. Sometimes we'll go up to a state and we'll help with crushing, which we did this last harvest. We took uh, what is it? Uh, uh, um, October, November, December, um, which are the latter part of the harvest. The bricks, the bricks tend to be a bit higher, mm-hmm. right? And uh, we, we took the drive and went up site and helped pick and crush on site. I took my whole team up there so the way they understand 
what goes into this. Yes, it's, and it's a lot. It's oh, a lot. it's devastating. I had no idea. This is hard. <laughs> it's hard. This work. is a hard job. And it gives you an appreciation for every glass of cider you're absolutely that you bring right. to your lips. Yep. And you know what's interesting too? You're sourcing it from these different places, and if you're crushing it and pressing at different spots, then you have different tools at different spots, which are going to lend different profiles to that juice, Precisely. whether it is a hydraulic, mm -hmm. you know, press, mm -hmm. pneumatic. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. press or bladder you know, or rack and cloth right so yep. I, I don't know the range that you're using but i imagine there's a pretty good range it's all the above i mean yeah. uh like the smaller guys i mean it's not uncommon for them to have the uh the uh the old school press um, um what's an old school press like like this is our traditional you know our traditional crank press yeah you know, yeah. it's a little bit bigger, and it yeah. probably, probably holds about 160 gallons. True, yeah. You know, yeah. it's just There's definitely a lot of people all, all over the world using a hand crank press where it's just pushing into the basket. That's all it yeah. is. Uh, well, here we have a water bladder press that we use. Um, you know, we'll bring, I think we brought in a total of 144,000 pounds of apples on site here where wow. we washed, crushed, you pressed. You do that out in the parking lot? We do it right here. Right in that uh, room we'll there. Do, we'll yeah. do a community press, and so nice. I'll call in patrons. There'll be about 30 of us, nice. and um, you know we'll all participate, and it's, it's getting that community involved right. to know what goes behind this That's this fantastic. work of art right here. So, That's great. Yeah, it, um, it's gratifying. It's extremely rewarding. What did you, was there anything that surprised you since starting this like almost a year into it and you got a whole bunch of stuff going on the map is there anything that's like oh, i didn't realize this about cider or the apple yeah you know i didn't know um you know i think when it came to our heritage ciders uh and i've i i you know coming from a, doing five gallon batches at home shifting to 160 to now 240 barrels you know, close to 4,000 gallons at a time for men. I mean, that's just, I blew my, it still blows my mind. I can't believe I'm even doing this. I'm in awe. Yeah. Um, but I, uh, I can't say, you know, I, I can't take all credit for it. I, the, because of the craft beer community uh, and the cider community, I've been able to reach out, you know, to other cider houses up in the Northwest, and they're very helpful for me. Uh, I think being able um, to, um, have consistent cider that that can be made in 14 days or it can be made in four years you know or or even 12 months for example all of our barrel aged you know three six nine 12 months um, it's constant tasting I and mean, you're constantly you to, checking you that you have to because you're losing a certain percentage right. of your beer in the barrel people yes. aren't aware there's always an evaporation yes uh, you know the kind of the angel the angel share yeah. yes which is like a distilling term but yes. you know, in terms of cider you put cider in the barrel you're going to learn lose about six percent yep and it's going to change in the barrel over time so oh boy how do you manage that any kind of tips on, on yep. barrel aging yep. that you've learned yep so we tend to start closely tasting 18 hours a day after about 30 days a day. a day for 30 days okay. and so i'll yep. break that up i have you know i have a i have a night cider ciderists and then i have a day ciderist and so they'll prepare tastings for me to come in after 30 days with barrel and taste for 18 hours on the hour to try that so we'll do that at 30 days uh we'll do that uh 40 days 60 and then 90 um i don't usually let ciders go beyond eight months um the ones that we do get to that length of time we incorporate co-ferments co-ferments and so this is something that's unique uh, we're big fans of graph ciders the graph cider in new york graph ciders and is a is a uh, yes those guys are first of all amazing okay but yeah. but in san diego uh it's a genre of ciders that incorporate um unfermented beer wort that we co-ferment in barrel over a length of time, which creates a very unique uh, uh, body in the cider, uh, a very unique nose, and then you get in wood and then it warms up everything, right? That's what that does. So mm -hmm. uh, we've just started toying with that. Um, graph, you've heard of a graph beer, mm -hmm. where it's 51% mm -hmm. apple, 49% uh, uh, 
That was the opposite way, right? Was it 49% apple, 51% malt? So we're not going to that extent. We're doing, you know, 60, 40, 70, 30 co-ferment blends uh, just in barrel right now. So that, uh, that is something that we're... Uh, so you haven't really with. served it to your customers No, yet. they're no. not allowed to have it yet. When's... when's yes, uh, they're not allowed to have that one when yet. When you see that you, release uh, coming up. Well, what I'll do is I'll send you, I'll send you a 500 ml bottle of that. I would love to try and, it, And yeah, uh, yeah. that'll be unique. We are using different types of enzymes to reduce that uh, uh, gluten in, the, in that wort mm. uh, so that it gets below uh, 10 ppm of gluten which mm -hmm. is huge for mm -hmm. our consumers. Yeah. Uh, I don't want to discount them. Uh, we have a lot of celiac uh, uh, patrons, patrons yeah. and uh, we have celiac employees oh. that believe in this business. Right, right, right. And they're all welcome here now. Right. And so that has been a huge turn of the century for craft beer. You're like the cross trainer of cideries, you know, because you've got the, like the that wine palette type mm -hmm. of thing. Mm -hmm. uh, you have that new cider drinker mm -hmm. uh, intro, and then you mm -hmm. have this other level of the heritage, which you seem like you're just on the cusp of releasing. I'll I'll, I'll give you. I have yeah. my uh, director of uh, of uh, barrel ops here. Um, I've partnered with and he actually works for one of the most prominent breweries here in San Diego um, and he gives me a very unique sense of depth of flavor uh, he he's a big uh, purist when it comes to heritage sires it's something that um, he's very strong in um, that I lean on for Good. you know because I can't yeah. be a master of everything yeah yeah so I know my I mean yeah you're uh, in two different worlds you are a unique cidery in that and I haven't really seen that You're, I only see that with the really really big big cideries that they're able to kick out a, one that's for the mm -hmm. a kind of like you know newcomer to cider sure. but yeah. I'll tell you this these four ciders that you presented here are are delightful so Lovely. if that's an intro for a new cider mm -hmm. drinker well hats off you know? it is yeah, yeah no it uh yeah, i'm thinking, interesting yeah i work with a lot of chefs too they have depth in their palate and yes, so yeah. uh, i have a tendency to have those guys involved in our tastings um but i really truly enjoy working with uh different artists you know like vintners distillers chefs uh brewers you know i use all all of those all those artists are, uh, are come here to use cider as a medium, mm -hmm. which is the start of Natopia. This is this product goes through an evolution. What I did not disclose to you is that next year, March of nineteen, I take this product and I distill an Applejack brandy. I was wondering if you're going to be right distilling. Oh, I was yeah. wondering. Oh, oh, good, yeah. good, good, good. Wow. So, so when you're saying this product, which one are you pointing all to? Of them. All of them. We're gonna be a full brandy house right next door. Right we uh, we have wow. 2,500 square feet right next door just for that. Um, in March, um, I just took over 4,000 square feet to expand our barrel program. I'm also doing a meat and cheese parlor because meat and cheese goes delightful with cider. Yes, it does. It's a perfect, perfect marriage between oh. food and cider. And we're doing our first cider and sausage collaboration. So I'm sending our. Uh, our semi-sweet and our Belgian pineapple to a sausage factory here locally in San Diego to create a wow. sausage cider blend nice. that will serve over on that side with nice. our artisanal cheeses. Wow. Um, but that's you know that's the wave of that future. Yeah, you know, bringing it all together. Yes, it's precisely. like a little mini world expo here. It's a compound. So what was this building before? This used to be a tile. Uh, factory okay. uh, before, so we had to scrape this thing down to its bare, bare roots and uh, completely, you know, uh, architect it to where um, our distribution had big capabilities through our backdoor mm -hmm. sales. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. Don't get me wrong. I mean, we are doing a significant amount of volume out of our tasting room. It's no joke. Imagine you and are. It's, yeah. it's it's packed here. You're constantly. open like seven days a week. Seven days a week. Yeah. And, and uh, there's not a lot of foot traffic. I mean, there's a sidewalk yeah. out front. Yeah. So yeah. distance yeah. between here and like, let's say San Diego Airport, people coming in, yep. they're going to get a lift or something up. Oh, we get here. them. Oh, we get them. Uh, between 12 to 15 minutes lift. Easy. Super easy. Super easy. Uh, always welcome. Uh, we have lift codes 
on Fridays and Saturday nights for our patrons to use. So that way, you know, we have to be responsible drinkers. Good. Right? That's important. Good, good. Yeah. And um, tourist time is huge here. I get people from all over the world coming here just because they like craft beer, and then they 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 pipe in gluten-free cider, and of course, who pops up? We pop up, yeah. and you know, it's like an aha moment. Mm. And believe it or not, we have 56 breweries on this road. 56 breweries. Eight distilleries on this on this road. So there's a lot of knowledge here, a lot of working knowledge. A lot of working into. knowledge. Yeah. A lot and of is there knowledge. any kind of like, oh no, cider's coming in now? A little bit of a competition edge there with the craft beer people. I not th- that they're not the best people in the world. Speaking as a craft beer writer for yep. X amount of years. Yep. Oh yeah. No, there's. Um, they've welcomed us. Believe it or not, um, they 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 have been making cider themselves, and so now they bet have they someone. Are. Oh yeah. I bet they are. Oh yeah. And so, yeah. Uh, you know, they are uh, very welcoming, and uh, we have. I think we've done close to a number. I think we've done twelve. Uh, collaborations with uh, some very prominent breweries here, some very highly skilled master uh, brewmasters. And there's a lot here in San Diego. There's an, an amazing range. If you can make it in San Diego and beverage, you can make it anywhere, That's just true. like New York. Yeah, it's true. If you can make it here, you're set anywhere. So uh, it's just, you know, it's just here you better make a right because there's a lot of consumers here that know their stuff They're savvy yeah they, very savvy so in that way it's it's kudos to the craft beer scene for creating yes. a sophisticated palette absolutely you know which took a long time in the craft beer scene initially Precisely. we're not talking about that long ago no so if that could happen in like 20 years in the craft beer scene imagine Utopia cider 20 years from now Oh, okay. Rick just like kind of did that spontaneous combustion yeah. thing with his hands to yep. the head. Yep. Yeah. No, can you relate to it. I can. Seriously. Yeah. It's gonna. It's it's the time is now. So if, yeah. for, for those of you that are listening that you know have the the conceptual idea of doing it, it went from dream to drink in five years, yeah. and that's real. And uh, it's being stubborn enough to to just block you know blow through walls and keeping your your dream active and always just you know always just just you know keeping your your head down and Mm -hmm. and and it comes to fruition you know there's a lot Mm -hmm. of hard work here um this wasn't easy to build this is uh you know 1.5 million dollar build out that has the production capacity to do 25,000 barrels a year Mm -hmm. so uh you know we're we're serious. This is this You've is got serious. A lot we're putting going on there. we're putting we're putting cider on the map. Yeah. Uh, not that it already hasn't been, but mm-hmm. we're essentially giving it a little bit more exposure to the beer connoisseurs and a whole range of a market that people weren't thinking about in California right. in that way. You're right. I mean, Apple mm-hmm. Valley up in uh, Watsonville mm-hmm. and all that. People didn't even realize that mm-hmm. like, California was a, such a high producer of mm-hmm. apples mm-hmm. nationally, mm-hmm. and I think. Southern Cal was looked at, oh, you know, not much is going to be happening, yep. blah, blah, you know, craft mm-hmm. beer's got the, the edge in San Diego, but no. Now, there's a couple of cideries in San Diego yes. now. Well, yes. What's the count? So, I think, um, technically, we're first to market. Uh, I think now we have a total of roughly six cider houses um, and the in the county, not, San, in, in, Di- San Diego, San county. Diego county. county right. Now, yeah, um, and they're Which is pretty wide. Yeah, wide. Just so folks realize that that's and a pretty wide map. Very wide map, and believe it or not, uh, each cider house. They're all distinctly different, mm-hmm. which is fantastic. I mean, Twisted Horn, uh, Raging Cider, Serpentine uh, are just just a, a, a few of my alliances. Mm-hmm. Uh, so we gather tightly. Uh, we you know we share information. Um, you know I'm uh, I've provided some insight on a few other cider houses to get up uh, because really it's all about all ships rise with the tide. Absolutely. You know, yeah, you created a mecca for cider drinkers. Yeah, it could be a nice location, I think, yeah. for cider con. Yes, you know. Oh, sunshine <laughs> and cider is in, it? And in February, yeah, people, are, all the all the orchardists yes. and people that are working so hard. Yes. Anyways. Yep. 
No, no, we're uh, we're uh, my next initiative this year is uh, is creating a guild for us, uh, so that way we can really get, get that information sharing involved, and, and everyone's side of it becomes better. I think that's important that cool. we do that. Uh, because it doesn't matter where a patron goes, if they go to a, a, a new cider house or one that's been in business, you know, it better be good. Because it might be their first time they're trying it. Yeah, and you don't want them turned off because they, they, they won't come back. They will not come back. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and, you, you get a, a one time to make an impression. Uh, fortunately, we have some great ciders in San Diego, so I'm hoping a lot of people will start to recognize that, um, you know, that, that side of the apple spectrum. There are apples that grow down here. Uh, you know, what are we, some of the varieties that are growing down yeah. here? It's all dry farming, means that there's no irrigation. Correct. Right. So, uh, and so we'll we'll use deep deep wells uh, uh, to extract sometimes five or six wells on a plot, um, and some of the most prominent, I think, local ones that you guys would probably be aware of is Kingston Black. Uh, we also have Gold Rush. We seen yeah. that before. Yeah, well, yeah, Gold Rush. Absolutely. Yeah. I have some in my. Dude. I grafted. Nice. I actually took down my my really? old tree this year. Nice. Yeah. Well, Gold Rush is a uh, pretty well known. I know Tom Oliver, and I think cool. he does a collaboration too with yeah. that. A number of Gold Rush. So what I didn't tell you guys, and I haven't told the rest of the public this, but um, uh, I have ten and a half acres, about two miles from here, on a microclimate. So it's quite unique. It's at about it rests at about twenty one hundred feet in elevation. It's in the foothills. But what's cool is that I get about nine hundred to a thousand hours of chill. Um, and we get Santa Anas. And so I get this really Santa Ana wind. Santa That's what Ana he's winds. referring to. Yes. Santa Ana wind. Unique. Ciderville knows that out there, but no, we have... No, probably not, like El Nino and all that kind of yes. thing. It's a very interesting climate here yep. Yep. because of the mountains. San Diego, you fly in, you might get rerouted sometimes, mm-hmm. not hardly ever, mm-hmm. but it could happen because of the fog. Mm-hmm. You're next, right next to the ocean. Mm-hmm. So he's talking about the Santa Ana winds. Yeah, talking. and so we'll get that marine layer that comes up over into our foothills, into our microclimate pocket. It gives us that extra chill. And uh, usually that marine level burns off at noon. And then over the mountains from the desert comes the Santa Ana winds that changes that temperature. Right so we up. get this big swing and temp. And bricks just goes whoop, right concentrates up. that yeah, sugar. sugar. Yeah. And it just swings those. So, wow. we'll, I, mean, I'll, I mean, I'll give you an example. We've had anywhere between 21 to 24 bricks out of some of these rattles, very, which is very, very apple nice. wine-ish. Yes, it you is. Know? Yeah, so, and you don't want to be diluting that, no. so you're going to have to manage that. We do. You, and so. you probably get taxed at different rates for all this, right? Yeah, it's cool. So um, uh, there's been some unique legislative laws I think most of us are aware the about. The CIDER Act. And the CIDER Act, but federally, the US. federally we, we went from getting charged uh, a dollar a gallon in taxes to seven cents a gallon in taxes. Which is huge for yes, us. Yes, it is. It is huge. It gives the ability for a small craft cider house to make a profit. Mm-hmm. That was the one piece that is struggling. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, you know, it's you know, you better dollar a gallon is a uh, lot. Yes, that adds up quickly when you're Super talking quickly. about hundred gallons. Boom. And that's all primary ferment. They yep. look at that. Yep. You know, uh, uh, and then they cross that over with your tax, your, your taxation. Uh, bright tank, right? Mm -hmm. And they see how that matches up. And so Mm -hmm. uh, that was a huge piece for us. Now, you know, this year that will swing us into being able to do other projects now with that money. You know, and growing. So yeah, that and was, we have the orchard. Ten and we acre have the orchard. orchard. Yeah. Wow. So um, I don't like to rest barrels and pay for rent. And so we'll have a working barn where we'll house our cider uh, and or spirits. We'll have um, an orchard that we'll just essentially have our Kingston Blacks. Uh, we'll have Gold Rush. We'll have maybe four or five different types of crabs. You know, nice. a little more tannic, so nice. I can blend in. Yeah, you know? yeah. Just, you're you're just right on the trail for it's time. Greatness. Yeah, and yeah, that'll be fun. that will be a uh, that will be a destination. Uh, facility where people oh. can actually rent out wow. and uh, have weddings there oh. uh, it'll be they'll have a small vineyard of course we have to have wines then we'll have an orchard there a working barn and then an urban farm um, is it, this all you Rick it is yeah do you ever sleep I don't <laughs> <laughs> sleep yeah right I mean what? No, I do, and I do, and I'm always counting the apples backwards. So it puts but me well, to you bed. have a, a good background because you're in the libation market already, so you have that going. 
He knew how to run an operation. And I think that's what folks need to realize. Like you could oh, have boy. a cidery, but when you actually have a tasting room, now you're managing staff at a oh, different boy. level. You're managing people mm -hmm. coming in, drinking, leaving your location. Yes. And if you don't know how to do that, that, that also that could consume a lot of stressful time. Oh, you're absolutely right. That's a different animal. I mean, I don't... Not that it has to be stressful. No. But so, it, and you it don't is. seem like a stressful person at all. Thank you, Ru. I appreciate uh, well, that. Well, Thank you. Hopefully, my wife so. will hear that. May it always be so. <laughs> I'm sure she knows. I'm oh sure boy. She knows. But no. you know, that's that's a big, it is big piece. It, and you know, when you walk into this facility, you know, it's you know, people have their their uh, their entitlement goes up. Oh, we're in a side house. Oh, this is kind of sophisticated here. Mm -hmm. Oh, this is this is whimsical here. Mm. You know, guess what? Your service better be better than Nordstrom's, because service is universal, and it's a quiet whisper that San Diego has poor service, oh. because when it's sunny, everyone goes to the beach. No one works oh. in San Diego. I didn't say anything, but now you guys have an inside scoop. Yeah. You want good service come in winter, but uh, no. But it's uh, it's just one of those where you have to mm. be able. To provide that, that, <laughs> like that. that one good service come in winter. winter. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. I just find San Diego is such a, a lovely area. I mean, it you, is. You can't can't beat it. I tried to yeah. leave. I couldn't come back. Yeah. You know, uh, I have a house in Seattle that we get up there still. Are you a native of California? I am a native of literally this little ranch. It's called Scripps Ranch. Oh, okay. And wow. so uh, it was initially built. In You're a, saying Scripps Ranch mean this area is this, called Scripps this, where we're. Correct. They were literally right. sitting in. There's about maybe 25,000 people here. Wow. Uh, it was originally used, uh, the eucalyptus were used for railroad ties for the Chinese when wow. we, we were bringing railroads wow. in here uh, from here to San Francisco. But they were so weak that they, weren't, they didn't work really well for ties, and so yeah, they brought them that. here. Oh. They brought them here. They put all of them here. They just plopped them all here. And we have 300 different types of species of Eucalyptus? eucalyptus here. I didn't know there was more than yes. one species of 300 eucalyptus. 300 different types. And they're beautiful trees. They're like a, 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 a white tannish body mm -hmm. tree. It, the, the bark is smooth. It is. And just absolutely stunning. It they're is. they're sun like trees. Skyline of, yeah. skyline of eucalyptus that's uh, super prominent. So. We should probably yeah, get a little tour let's do if a we tour. can. Thank you, Rick, for hosting both The Nose and I and sharing your wealth of information and your enthusiasm. It always kind of keeps me inspired, too, and I'm sure all the folks out there in Ciderville. Uh, there are photos in the show notes. You could see me signing the Newtopia banner. Uh, there'll be a little video, too, coming out on the Cider Chat YouTube channel. Uh, I really appreciate those crawlers to go that Marion Barry whoa, that just blew my mind that you made with the champagne yeast. It, it just shows how cider in that modern style can be an incredible base for these complex flavor profiles. He had an eggnog going on. Of course, he had a chai. He heats it up, and then he's doing that graft, that fusion with wort from beer. Yeah, San Diego is a happening scene, and we'll be we'll be keeping an eye out. There's other cideries to get to, too, in that area, and so many more around the world. When I come right back, I want to share a little bit from Robbie Honda of Tanuki Cider Company in Santa Cruz, California. On episode 103 of Cider Chat, I had the good fortune to be able to feature Robbie Honda. This guy, he just has stolen my heart, and I was able to see him at CiderCon along with Nicole from Santa Cruz Cider Company and Jake from Five Mile Orchard. You know, it was like the Monterey Bay scene, and uh, you know, obviously I have a warm spot in Ciderville in my heart for that area. Uh, my family lives there, and and I lived there too. So unexpectedly today, I went down, check in my mail, and I got this little letter. And he writes, um, Hi, Rhea. My first Cytokon experience would not be complete without raising a glass with you. He continues to write, I intended to hand you this letter at the conference. Sorry I spaced it and kind of makes this fun face. Anyways, a thank you for sharing the greater cider experience with all of us. You are an excellent journalist journalist and ambassador to the cider community. Oh man, we admire you. 
man, I admire you for writing such a, a, a righteous little letter. And he just does that um, nice little salutation, come pie, Tanuki Cider, Santa Cruz, California. And uh, he basically sent me a check, uh, a total of $2 per episode for 114 episodes. So you could do the math for that. Blew me out of the water, Robbie. You cannot believe. I will immediately put this to good use. Thank you. A million zillion apples. We're putting you on the Cider Going Up campaign page for Cider Chat. This kind of like stepping out for a cidery that is a total startup. It's just getting a footing. I know life has been tough. He was working with his brother. He lost his brother who was doing the labels. There's just so much that this guy is persevering through, and he brings a beautiful flavor to Ciderville. Big tip of the glass to you, and uh, whew, uh, I'm speechless. Thank you so much. I really, really appreciate it. And to all you out there in Ciderville, we are lucky to have each other. So on this Valentine's Day when it's going live and every single day, make it a love day in Ciderville. And this is Rhea Wincaller signing off for now with a little tear in her eye for all of you and a whole lot of love. See you soon in Ciderville. Yeehaw!